This is Maria. Maria is a tobacco hornworm, Manduca sexta, and she is an astonishing creature. For example, you'll notice that she's a turquoise colour. Wild versions of this that you probably find in your garden sometimes. In fact, one of them tried to build a pupa on the, uh, on the shed that I'm currently using as a teaching room. And um, they're green. They're a bright lime green. And this is because on their usual plant on which they grow and live, they get certain pigments that they don't get from this one who is captive bred. Maria has never known freedom. She's here to uh, introduce an assignment you're going to get, and that assignment will have FRQs about this creature pertaining to every section of the course. For example, in the Chemistry of Life section, which was Unit 1, you might look at the, uh, the pigment molecules that give her her camouflage colours and the amazing colour patterns that she has that are all caused by different amounts of different kinds of different proteins that act as pigments, therefore colouring. One of the really unusual things about her is that she will turn into a hawk moth. A hawk moth is the hummingbird of the insect world. So currently you can see that she's a kind of walking digestive system. She has pretty amazing jaws. She has, well, she's nothing more than a digestive system really, with a bunch of, a, of adaptations that coat that digestive system and mean that she's able to survive. So she's gaining energy, and by gaining energy, She's going to get the energy to become that amazing hawk moth. And at the moment, the genes that are working in her, well, there's very few of them. But when she becomes a pupa, those genes, many of them, will be switched off. And what will be switched on is a bunch of different genes for wings, for mating, for reproduction. Because the larval version of this organism and the adult version of this organism are very, very, very different things. So what we have with her is there are going to be certain situations where some of her genes are working and, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Oh my goodness, that's disastrous. This is Alexander. Alexander is a bearded dragon from Australia, and these are wild where I grew up as a child. And I kept quite a lot of these when I was a lad. It's Pagona viticeps. This is the central version. The ones that lived around my area were Pagona barbata. Still bearded dragons, but quite different looking. So if I were to look now at the, um, the sections of the course, excuse me please Alexander, we get Unit 1, Chemistry of Life. Oh, you can't see that very well. I'm sorry about that. Alexander, could you help me hold that up, please? Thank you very much. So, Chemistry of Life. We might look at keratin. Alexander's outer body covering is keratin, the same as your fingernails, your hair. But this keratin is a different version from what makes up the keratin in your body. So, keratin beta is what Alexander has. And he's not a very willing star right now, you can just see his tail. But yes, that version of that keratin is something we might use as an FRQ in chemistry of life. With cell structure and function, you might have noticed he's already changed color a bit in the course of this video. He's turned a yellower, and that's because he has already begun to express different genes through the course of this video. He did have white ones on because I had him under his heat lamp and he was quite warm enough. But now he's a little bit cross with me. In fact, he's very cross with me. In fact, I hope he'll stay there long enough for the rest of the video and he won't run away. He's turning yellow. He's turning these colours and his beard might be turning a little bit darker because it was pure white when I brought him out. And what will happen is, when he's under a bit of stress, which I'm afraid he is now, what happens is the genes for different pigment proteins begin to be activated. 
and they get transcribed onto RNA. The RNA comes out onto, my, onto ribosomes. Those ribosomes begin to produce these pigments, and here he is, turning a different colour. In the third part, cellular energetics, bearded dragons undergo something called brumation when it gets cold. When I was a boy, I used to find them in the, in the fields around where I lived, and I would lift up a log and there would be one of these bearded dragons, not active like Alexander is now, not active at all, but instead seeming quite dead. And this was like a form of hibernation that they would undergo when it got a bit cold. We keep him under a heat lamp and when we keep him under a heat lamp, it keeps him nice and warm and makes us more able to treat him as a nice pet. With cell communication and the cell cycle, um, the ones I had in South Australia, I kept several as pets, they grew really, really slowly. Alexander has tripled his length in three months, and I think he's something like ten times the mass that he was at the start when we first had him. Oh, he's trying to lick me now. So, that means that he's undergoing mitosis a lot more rapidly than before. So we might ask you a question about why on earth he is undergoing mitosis more rapidly. And these are just some of the things that we might look at in terms of asking FRQs about one particular organism. Now you're not going to get um, questions about Alexander. And the reason you're not going to get questions about Alexander is that I've designed all of the assignments to be based on an organism that does live in the Pacific Northwest and you've probably seen. So we won't be talking about his magnificent behaviours and how he does his wonderful head bobbing and how he licks the ground. He actually licked the laptop while we were making this video and how he waves his arms and so forth. So he's an amazing creature, but you'll be getting an assignment about a creature of the Pacific Northwest rather than Alexander. And that will come very soon.